I'm Richard Vobes, TV's bald explorer, and I'm discovering Britain. I'm in East Sussex on the south coast of England, deep in the stunning South Downs National Park. Today, I'm seeking something tall and something refreshing. Care to join me? One of the most notable features of Sussex is the South Downs, and that's where I am today. It's England's newest national park, obtaining its official status from April 2011. But the idea of protecting it goes back to the 1920s. The South Downs extends over 100 miles right across the southeastern counties of England, from Winchester in Hampshire right over to Beachy Head in East Sussex. It was the last of Britain's 12 recommended national parks to be designated. The administrator's task is to conserve the natural beauty, wildlife and cultural heritage of the area. Comprised of flint and chalk, the South Downs have been inhabited since ancient times and they're peppered with earthworks, hill forts and other more modern anomalies. It's one of those anomalies that I'm looking for. And those of you who know the place name Wilmington will probably know what I'm in search of. And really and truly, I shouldn't miss it because it's pretty big. Ah, there it is. The Long Man, a chalk figure cut into the slopes of Wendover Hill, or the Wilmington Giant, as the locals call him, or as some refer to him as the Green Man. And I'll tell you why in a minute. The hill figure, well, he's deceptive because when you're close, he looks tall and drawn out, holding his mysterious staves. He's actually 72 metres tall, which is about 235 feet in old money. Viewed from afar, he looks much more proportional. And anyway, when you are close, you just lose all the definition. But who is he? And why was he carved on the north side of the Downs? Was he scraped away by Iron Age man to ward off enemy tribes? Or was he worshipped by the Druids as an Earth God? Perhaps we'll never know. There was a suggestion that he'd been cut from the turf by monks from nearby Wilmington Priory. But that argument was squashed by a counter question. Why would the monks depict a man without clothes? And what about his staves? Is he a pilgrim? Modern archaeological research suggests that the figure dates from the 16th or 17th centuries. Although for much of the time, it seems to have existed only as a shadow or indentation in the grass, visible after a light fall of snow, or as a different shade of green in the summer, hence the name the Green Man. The chalk outline we see today is the result of restoration work that was carried out in 1873. The original idea was to cut back to the chalk layer, but that proved too difficult, so it was outlined in yellow bricks. During the Second World War, the long man was painted in green to avoid being used as a landmark by enemy aircraft. What we see today is new blocks painted white, and not chalk at all. So. The figure still remains a mystery, but it does allow us to conjure up our own answers in our imagination. One thing's for sure, he is undeniably large, and those staves he holds are open to interpretation. But I wonder, maybe they're just a couple of old malt shovels. You see, in a converted barn at Littlington, a stone throw from the Long Man is a brewery. A malt house existed at Church Farm during the mid-19th century, and as long ago as 1538, a brew house chamber was listed as part of the premises. The Long Man Brewery, however, is a little younger than that. 
We started in February 2012. Uh, the plant was fully installed and commissioned around March of that year. So I put the first brew through. We had three beers. Um, we decided to have a 4% Best Bitter, which is still the country's favorite real ale, uh, style-wise. Uh, we also went for a 3.8% uh, Blonde. And we also did a pale as well. Being joined with the farm, we actually grow our own malting barley. Um, so it's produced uh, you know, only a couple of hundred yards away, um, which is, from a brewer's uh, sort of point of view, fantastic. Church Farm, yeah, so my granddad moved here in 1943. Uh, he moved from 10 miles up the road, uh, milked the cows there in the morning and then walked them here, milked them here in the afternoon. Um, so we've been, we've, been here, we've been here since. We're a mixed farm, so we've got, we used to have a dairy herd here. Um, we've got beef cows now and sheep, arable. Um, and but the dairy cows sadly went about 10 years ago. Um, so we've had to sort of diversify and certainly underneath the chalk downs here is one of the most important aquifers in the southeast and it supplies water to the whole of all, of all, all of Eastbourne and Brighton. In Sussex alone, there's something like 65 microbreweries now, um, you know, just in that county alone. And so invariably, yeah, there is a lot of competition and that is being driven by the consumer and by the locals in their pub uh, wanting to drink, you know, well-crafted uh, local beers. For me, personally, I see that as an absolute bonus because the more breweries that open up, then if that means we need to constantly up our game, then I think see that as only a good thing for you know beer producers and drinkers alike. Well, whether the long man of Wilmington was a brewer, a disrobed monk, farm labourer, a pilgrim or godly icon, it looks like he's here to stay, cared for by the local community. So if you're in the area, do drop by and give him the once over and try one of these fabulous beers. So, don't forget, join me again the next time I go exploring.